Thanks for joining us this afternoon. We are going to talk to you about developing your social discovery skills uh, for more effective news gathering. We're going to cover a little bit more than the title suggests. We're going to talk about uh, discovery tools um, and focus uh, on ethics as well in order to, to be your most effective at news gathering. Um, that will come in the second half. Um, a little bit about who we are. Um, I'm Fergus Bell and this is Mandy Jenkins. Uh, Mandy is from Storyful, I am from Dig Deeper. We are part of the First Draft Coalition. You may have seen several of the sessions across the conference programming have been um, supported by First Draft. We are a coalition of um, organizations that focus specifically on news generated content, social news gathering, uh, verification, search and discovery, um, and we, uh, all of our all of our kind of thoughts and case studies on this subject uh, will appear on firstdraftnews.com. So a lot of what we're talking about today, we have written up. Um, I'm sure there will be a write up of this session. There will be a write up of this session as well. If you if your note taking is not particularly fast, or you don't want to take notes. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. We're, gonna, we're just going to get yeah. straight into it. In. We've got a lot to get through, so um, if you do need a recap, then please go to Alistair's story later on, because he will have captured everything. <laughs> um, so, social news gathering. Um, monitoring is, is the first step of that. Uh, maybe you can, you can start with monitoring, Mandy. Yeah. yeah. So you know, one of the first things that you need to be doing as part of, of any social news gathering process is, is actually having something set up in advance before news breaks that is going to help you monitor for looking for that in the first place. And, I, and at Storyful, well, we're a social news gathering organization. This is what we do full time. Uh, monitoring is something that we have someone staffed to do 24-7, at least one person. And you know, the ways that we do that are primarily by building lists. So lots and lots of lists, Twitter lists, Facebook lists. Uh, setting up contacts. Uh, we also use a tool called Feedly, which can, is actually feeding in a lot of different things from YouTube, from Twitter, Vicontakte. Lots of research goes into building a monitoring list. And honestly, it's very, very manual. Uh, from what we do, we're putting together that monitoring around locations. So we have lists for every country, every major city, uh, lots of ongoing major stories like the refugee crisis. There are many, many lists and many, many resources built around that. So what's going to be key for you to set up monitoring is doing all of that work in advance and be constantly revert going back to how you're going to make sure those lists are up to date. So when a story is breaking, adding new people so that your monitoring will be even more effective later on. So I've just been very brave here and uh, shared my tweet deck, which I'm always really nervous doing. Um, I can't see it on my screen. So this is my tweet deck, and the, what I, I've set this up um, for general monitoring. So uh, I find this to be the most effective way. It took me a couple of years to get to this point, really, where I'm comfortable with my sources. I have, um, you know, I have my, my, home, my home feed, my mentions. I have a list of journalists and news junkies that tweet, that monitor a lot of lists mm -hmm. and people as well. So I only have to monitor, you know, if I monitor 20 or 30 really good journalists who are monitoring 20 or 30 really good journalists or sources, that's more effective. I also created a list um, of every single news alert I could find put out by a news organization on Twitter. Um, that is a private list. You will not find it on my account because it took me that long to do. That's that I get to benefit from it. Um, news sources as well. So most most news organisations automatically publish to Twitter when they post a story, or they certainly used to when I set this up. And it's surprising how many still do. Um, so that's why I set that up. And then I have you know I monitor news innovation um, and a separate separate list of journalists. Um, and really, the key for making that monitoring work for you is, is exactly putting those lists together. And it's about what's going to work for you. I mean, we're, we're a company that's monitoring the world on social media, so we have to be tracking different lists of sources around the world. But if you have a specifically local focus, a political focus, a sporting focus, you know, there's lists to be built for that that you can get as, as niche as you need to be to make sure that you're very, very effectively able to hone in on what it is that you're looking for all the time and that you will be one of the first people to know when something is going on. 
Preparation is key when it comes to lists, and it is hard work, but it pays off. And you can recycle lists if you put in the, the time and effort and you keep on top of them. For example, uh, in the US, elections come around every four years. Quite often, the same people are up for election, um, the same candidates. So if you are monitoring, if you're a, a reporter monitoring a particular race, you can just refresh your lists when, whenever you need to, to monitor that. And beyond the life cycle of an election, actually, those sources that you've added to the list may be valuable. Um, I've been involved in, in monitoring big events like the elections or the Olympics. And really, a list can be a beat that you have to monitor. Um, but the key is maintenance as well. If you don't maintain them, they'll just get old and they'll become useless. And when breaking news happens, uh, you won't, you'll, you'll have to start from scratch, essentially. Right. And it's very tough, and you have to be very disciplined with yourself about keeping those lists up to date. But then the breaking news story is the opportunity when you're doing more searching and you're doing more of the discovery that we'll get into later, as you're finding new people, like, oh, this is a journalist I wasn't previously following who's on the ground in Kenya. They should definitely be on my Kenya list. I don't know why they're not there, but I found them related to the story. So doing that on an ongoing basis, even amid breaking news, is going to make those lists better. My one, my one top tip for lists is actually um, is looking at what other people have done. A lot of people have put in the work already and um, some of uh, Twitter also does lists, has some lists like it does a world leaders list um, of all the world leaders who have the verified accounts on Twitter and pulling up that list on a big breaking story that has global implications is just really useful. And something that is a huge, uh, a huge help for us is there's a tool out there, it's, it's a very basic name, but it's a Twitter list copy tool. And when you copy Twitter lists that are already public on others' accounts, you can merge them with your own account. So if you have a list and you found someone else who has an amazing list that would really look great merged with your list, you could use the Twitter list copy tool to merge those together. If only we could build so much more of those for all the other social networks, but that's a good one. Um, it, would, it wouldn't be a complete um, presentation without some kind of Star Wars reference, so I always have to try and work one in. Um, <laughs> So, discovery and search is the other element, really. It's very closely tied to monitoring, but mon monitoring is helping you uh, spot stuff that you didn't know was happening by, by thinking ahead of time. Discovery and search is really when you know something is happening and you're focusing your attention on it. Um, so, we used to discover things by focusing on the agencies. We used to the agencies used to tell us something that was happening, and uh, we used to then go and search, and search for that content. Or we'd hear it from our reporters, it would come through the news desk, a fax would come into the newsroom, whatever. Um, now, TweetDeck, Twitter, um, other, other digital sources are your, are your agencies. Because, and the agencies are also on those digital, digital sources. Um, we, uh, we're going to just whiz through this quite quickly, but there are some tools out there that you can help. These will all go in. These are just a selection of tools um, that will help you. So there are uh, paid tools like uh, Samdesk that will help you find content when you know something's breaking. Geofedia is another one. Um, Dataminer uh, is a tool that will help you, that will tell you that something is happening before you know it, but then also allow you to search within it. Um, these these are very effective tools. There are lots more out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is also, you know, Banjo, Ground Signal. I mean, you've probably heard of a lot of these, and um, at least for a lot of these paid tools, one thing I'll say is I, I think that saying, like, this is better than this, or this is one that you should definitely use, I say try what you can, see what works for you. Some newsrooms are going to work better on one versus another, so it's worth trying them out. Yeah, it's really... Uh, when, you, when you're thinking about tools for your newsroom, you should think about the scale of your operation, you should think about the geography, and you should think about the networks that you want to be searching. Because some tools are very good with, with certain networks. They have a strength when, in monitoring or displaying data or content from certain networks. If those networks are not the ones that you're interested in monitoring, then, then that's something that you need to consider. Price point is also something you need to consider as are our seats. Uh, and and, yeah, one, and yeah. one last thing on that, too. The paid tools are not your only option. I mean, there are lots of free tools that are definitely worth checking out. 
Um, a couple I recommend that, that can help with searching. A photo map is very, very low cost. It's a Mac app. It's a Mac app, but it's a built-in. Helps you search Instagram. Gram feed is another one that can help you search Instagram pretty effectively. Um, and, and really just getting onto the networks themselves and doing some effective searching. So if you're going to be on YouTube, doing your searches in there, doing your searches on the, in Twitter, you can attempt to do searches in Facebook that sometimes works. But um, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways to, to get around having to pay for something, too. And I'm certainly happy to talk to anybody about getting into more of those free tools a little later, too. So we're going we're gonna to also talk about workflows again mm -hmm. in a moment. But it's worth saying that whenever you are Im implementing a new tool in a social news gathering process, you need to think about what that process is going to look like in your newsroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and, see, and that will help you determine which tools you, you may need. Um, but back onto discovery, uh, journalists speak in a certain way. We use certain terms in headlines, uh, in the way that we write, in the story slugs that we might use internally to describe events. But real life people do not use those events. I have never, you know, I've I've never uh, heard a blast or witnessed a blast, but I have seen an explosion. If as a normal person, you know, so you've got to start. So when we are searching um, socially, we have to uh, think about how people are sharing this content, who they are sharing it with. People are not sharing it to be found by the media. They are sharing it with their friends. They are sharing it with people who know the area that they are operating in, that they are living in. Um, and so I've got a, a selection on, on the screen now. Wherever the screen is. That um, will give you an example of some of the words that you might want to start searching for. Swear words are very useful um, because when you see something pretty incredible, you do tend to swear, especially if you are, uh, you know, younger people tend to swear more on social media, I think. Mm -hmm. You also have to think about the language, slang terms, uh, the, the actual language that people are speaking. If, you're, if you are you know, in your own, if, if you're in your own country and you're speaking and you're looking for people who speak your own language, that's one thing. If you're searching in a different country, they won't be speaking English or they won't be speaking Italian for you. Um, communities as well. If you are focused, if you're in a big city and it's uh, divided into lots of different communities and you know language, the languages are diverse, search for the language that you expect to come up. And, you know, if you are searching for uh, content from a Justin Bieber concert, the language is going to be very, you know, if something happens there, which ha it has happened at Bieber concerts, the language is going to be very different to what you would find at a Coldplay concert. Or, <laughs> or <yeah>. here. <laughs> or here, yeah. Um, so language is, is really important. And when you're doing those searches, you know, you're going, some of them aren't going to work. You know, some are not going to turn something up. So it's a lot of trial and error and a lot of opening many, many tabs and opening many, many searches to really make that discovery and search part of it work when you're looking for those kinds of keywords. Because no, no two people are going to use the same exact wording. So you're going to have to really expand your net quite a bit to do that. Yeah, I think that, that tab thing, <laughs> using tabs, I haven't really found a, a better way of searching. So when I search for a, if I know that something is breaking, I will have different YouTube searches or different Twitter searches open across all the ta across a whole load of tabs, different variations of the words, different combinations of the words, slightly different locations, and I will just go through and refresh. Um, that To me, that's the most efficient way of me being able to spot when something new pops up, rather than having a really long uh, Boolean search that includes you know, a lot of or uh, combinations. And a, a brief plug I will do that is helpful for search. Um, if you use the Chrome browser, Storyful has a free plugin called the Storyful Multi Search that actually does a lot of those Booleans for you to specifically look for photos and videos. So if you use Chrome, which you should because it's great, um, definitely uh, check that out if you want to get some help with searching. So it's just a button that you can push, put in some keywords, and it opens up all of those tabs for you and helps you try to locate videos and photos. Plug over. So the. Um Technology companies, platforms, um, whatever you would like to call them, network, social networks, are also starting to help n navigate their, their, um, their networks and their content. Um, the help that they give is sometimes limited. Um, 
sometimes it's limited by what you're actually able to get, sometimes it's limited by region. Um, I'm displaying Facebook's signal at the moment. If you are a US journalist, I believe that you, if it's mm -hmm. useful, is it useful in, in the US? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's not, the, the coverage isn't, isn't uh, expanded outside um, really. So if you, if you do have access to it outside of the US, you, there's only a, you can spot the trends, you can, you can follow the uh, story from Newswire, Facebook Newswire, but um, so a lot of the other elements to it are, are really US focused on US politicians or US uh, sports teams. Uh, Google Trends is another um, dashboard that you can use. I think this is sometimes underrated as a way of spotting breaking news or spotting stories within breaking news. You would imagine a trend to not necessarily um, be relevant at that time. You know, something has to, has to take some time to become a trend. But what I find is useful around a certain story is if there is an anomaly. So you can look at the 10 most popular searches around a certain story, and if there is one search there that doesn't fit with everything else that is being looked at, then that might be because a certain community that is following that story is focusing on one specific issue that the rest, the, the, there isn't a lot of coverage for. So it's, you can spot the anomaly rather than be alerted to the, to the main event with Google Trends. So um, verification is, is one of the ma major things that, that we focus on and that, that we talk about. And I use this video because I was explaining to, to Mandy, my, my friend, I was at a party and my friend said, oh, the other day, my friend who lives in California, a whale landed on her kayak. And I, you know, this video went viral. Every, it was everywhere. Um, and she, she had no idea. Um, so what we are trying to do, and First Draft is, I think, trying to do, is move beyond this video could not be verified. This video, this photo, this information could not be verified. Because there are processes out there that, that mean that that's not true. So we we are moving towards a, a way of working that is transparent and that informs the audience how far you have been able to, to get in terms of that uh, verification. And some of this is tools, some of it is process, but it, but it all works together. Um, I'm gonna show you my verification process, Mandy's gonna show you hers, um, and you can, you can take whichever bits you want uh, away. And they're pretty similar, but just set out differently. So my my verification process is uh, this uh, here. You, you can take photos of it, whatever. Um, I, so it's a two-track process. Verify the source, verify the content. That means just like you do with any other story, you are, getting two, you, know, you are following two tracks in order to, to confirm it. So verifying the source is, looking at, is doing things like reviewing social history, making contact with them, asking them questions, uh, securing permission to use. You know, if you don't speak to them, how do you actually secure permission to use that content on your output? That is an ethical question we will come back to. Um, the second part is verifying the content. So that is saying, this person was here at this, we can say, this person was here at this place, at this time, they witnessed this. But they may have been 200 meters away. We're not gonna take their word for it for what, we, what they've actually captured, the event that actually happened. So therefore, we're verifying the content, translating anything in the background or the audio, consulting with experts, um, seeking independent, separate confirmation, um, and then most importantly, establishing the context. I'm of the opinion that there is no point in taking something from, um, from social media, or using something from social media, if you can't actually explain the story behind it, because that's what we do. Um, it's going to live there fine, and people are going to find it, um, even if you don't, you know, if you if you don't add that context. But if people, if you want people to come to you, that is the thing that you can you can add to it. So, once you've kind of done both of those tracks, they should add up to the same thing, and that means the content is verified. And Mandy's going to, I think it's you've got a similar process, but you're mm -hmm. going to go into more detail around the right. questions and tools. So at Storyful, uh, the, the main part of our process is really focusing in on three key areas of, of verifying. So we want to verify the source, everything we can know about the person behind it, uh, the time and date, so that we know that this is something that's current, 
and the location. And the way that we do this is very, it's, it's actually very old school in a lot of ways. It's, um, it's one of my favorite parts of the job is for one thing, you're asking a lot of questions, it's just you're not necessarily asking a person. You're interviewing a piece of content pretty often. So in this case, starting with the source, you know, you're examining everything about them. What can you find out about this person that you can know that they were where they're supposed to be? You know, does their account seem real? Do they interact with other people? Are they in the location where they set where the story is supposed to happen? If they have amazing photos from Kathmandu during an earthquake, but you have no record of them ever going there. If there's there a picture of them in an airport ahead of time with their thumbs up, like, hey, I'm, I'm in Kathmandu. You know, if you're seeing something like that, that's gonna be more of an indicator that it's real. If they have a New York everything account and suddenly they have these mysterious photos from another side of the world, that's highly questionable. They probably don't own that. So looking at their uploading history, look at where they've been before. And a big part of this is not just to find out the source, but it's their connection to the story. It's about that context that Fergus was talking about. And in doing all of this backgrounding on the source, this is also how we're gonna find the way to contact them. As often as possible, you know, we're gonna try to find a way that's not gonna be just bombarding them on social media, but you know, finding a phone number, finding an email address, getting to them in a way that's gonna make sense to contact them for wherever the location that they're in and the situation that they're in. So doing all of this can really help with that. And really seeing where they are online is a big part of that. And some tools that we use to, to do some of this, um, I won't go into all of them individually, but things like uh, Spokio and Pipple are great for starting to look up people online, looking at where, they're, where they are, where they're located. You can start to see, okay, this person, they have the same name. They are in Wichita, Kansas. I, that's exactly where we needed them to be because that's where the story is. They have a whole history there. They have a footprint there. So looking at their footprint is a big part of that. Just, just mm -hmm. before you move on, I would mm -hmm. say that one of the best ways for me to, f to identify the veracity of the source is, is actually to look at Twitter itself. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, you've got a, if, you, if you found someone on Twitter, scrolling back through their posts and mm -hmm. photos and videos will tell you a lot about who that person is right. and if that person could have been there at, at the right time. And I've actually done a reverse image search on a Twitter profile photo mm -hmm. in order to get uh, acts in order to find that same photo that they've used on other accounts. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes people don't use their names on Twitter, but, but they often use the same profile photo if they like it. Mm -hmm. So the actual, the actual place that you find them can be really useful. Right, and there's a great um, a Chrome extension called Falcon that actually will help you find related social accounts as well. So if they have the same email that's associated across several public accounts, if you're on Facebook, it'll show you their Twitter, their YouTube, their Instagram. So that can be really helpful for finding other accounts to really get a better idea of who this person is and, and their, their social history. So getting into location, you know, for one thing, the source is a big part of that. You know, what is their connection to this? Do, do they volunteer in this place? You know, is this somewhere where they've been before? But also for us, and a big part of the process, is geolocating what we can find in videos and photos against other information we know. In this case, uh, we often use Google Earth for this. So if this video, you know, has there's this red roof over here. Um, let's see, I can see a church steeple back in there. So I'm gonna get into Google Earth in the location where it's supposed to be happening and actually look around until I find those specific points of location so I can say, yes, this is definitely here. So sometimes that's street signs. Sometimes it's going to be maybe a restaurant sign that you can see in front of somewhere. But sometimes you don't get those hints and it makes it a lot harder. Pretty much anything that's shot indoors is extremely difficult to do that with. Anything that is a... Uh, Anything that's in a desert, also pretty difficult. There's not a lot around there. So you, you have to take every little hint that you can get, but when you have something that you can really dig into, that's really helpful. And with video especially, you know, if you've got audio that can really help with that, languages, dialects, sounds of cars. Actually, one that is a great indicator for me are sirens, uh, because sirens sound very distinctive in different countries. You're like, oh, hmm, that sounds, that sounds like a distinctively New York siren or there's one like a very European siren sound. I can't really explain it, but you know what I'm talking about when you've heard sirens mm -hmm. in other I'm places. I'm not sure we do. You okay. don't? <laughs> Come on. You just don't hear enough sirens, no. Fergus. <laughs> I actually yeah, have identified a video previously by, it was, we eventually worked out it was filmed in a, in a quarry because you could hear the, the conveyor belt lifting up the, mm -hmm. 
the rocks and they're, they're kind of tink, 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 tink. And it took us a long time to, and once we knew that, we could, we could pinpoint the location of this really important video. Um, I'll tell you what, so go on to tools. I, I was going to talk about tools actually mm -hmm. and say these tool, there are tools out there, but there is a lot of development being, going on in, in this area. Um, neural networks are, are going to be a really big uh, element here in, able, in, in order to quickly identify locations and objects that might give, give uh, indications of the location. And there's a lot of development happening in the space for sure, but right now a lot of this process is a lot of deduction, a lot of detective work, and a, a lot of manual labor of looking around to find, to find what, what you can line up against that. Uh, finally, the last piece for us is the date. And so, you know, you can look at things like upload times, but they're not always going to be helpful. Someone might have uploaded something long after the fact, um, or maybe they did something right away, or maybe it's on a different network and it came from a different place first. But um, looking at actual times of upload and knowing the time zone where that is, that's one that throws people off all of the time. Um, different networks have, are located in different time zones for what that's going to be. It's not going to necessarily be local time. You know, anything on Facebook is on California time. So you have to know, like, oh, okay, so it was this time of day, and how that lines up with what I know about the, the situation. So um, looking at things, too, like the weather. You know, if you know that in this video it's pouring rain, and you can look online. We actually use a tool called Wolfram Alpha that's really helpful for looking at weather patterns and historical weather as well to say, oh, was it raining that day in this place? If it was a few days ago, is it raining right now in this place? Are other people on Twitter talking about how terrible this rain is? then okay, that's probably a good sign that that is from today because it's very rainy. The shadows are another thing. High noon is going to look very different from late in the afternoon. It's going to look different from the morning. So looking at all of those details are going to help you to know not only is this today, but was this the right time of day? If we've got the place, we've got the person, what can we know about the time and the date to really make sure that that lines up? Um, we'll be getting an EXIF data a little bit later, but that can be really helpful as well for finding out a lot of this because a lot of it's embedded in images. So if you get the original, you've done all of your work on the source, you've gotten in touch with that person, and they've sent you an original, you're going to be able to get a lot more information from that. And yeah, a couple more tools. <laughs> a lot of people, I, I certainly get a, a lot of questions, you know, what's the one tool that we should have? What's, uh, you know, we need, we can only afford one, we can... The answer, unfortunately, is there is no magic solution to this. And actually, it really depends what you're verifying. You, if you're verifying, you know, if, if, the, if pinning down the exact time of day is, your, is the, um, the thing that you need to, to determine to be able to verify this piece of content, then, you know, shadow analysis, which can take a lot of time and can be quite complex, will be the thing, the tool that you need. It's not going to be useful to, to look up all the social accounts because you, that, might be, that might be easy. Mm -hmm. So it's all about building up a case using all of the tools that you have available to you, mm -hmm. as well as the tools that are in your newsroom, and that's the expertise of staff mm -hmm. and experience on stories, experiences in the region. Yeah, the number one tool you need are the journalists you already have. So good, good start. So this is the EXIF. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not. Sorry. Uh, so... One of the most important things that you can use a tool, that a tool can get you really, f take you uh, quite far along the path for is uh, finding the original source of a photo uh, at the very, uh, but assuming that you found the, f uh, the network that it's been shared on for the first time. Or, so uh, Amnesty International have uh, something called YouTube Data Viewer, which just gives you the exact time that a video was uploaded. And this can be re on, on YouTube. This can be really useful when videos are uploaded within, within the same minute as each other, which can happen quite a lot mm -hmm. uh, as, as scraping uh, happens. Google reverse image search, TinEye, they all allow you to put in a photo and it searches to see if that photo exists elsewhere. They're not perfect. No. They're, not, they're not a perfect solution, but they, they might help you confirm suspicions or at least add add to that case. And they can certainly help you from making some of the big mistakes that we see happen in media where in a big breaking story there's an old photo or it's from somewhere else that someone starts sharing, it moves around, everyone starts mistakenly retweeting it 
Every, you know, sometimes it even ends up on the front pages of newspapers when a very quick reverse image search would show that that was not the case. And we had that happen um, just, just last week with the Brussels story. There was a, you know, photos and videos going around that were from Moscow years before in a different situation entirely. But people were sharing and saying, no, this is, what, this is here. This is what happened in Brussels. Doing reverse image searching can really help with something like that. Excellent. So yeah, I was talking a bit about EXIF data. Is it actually playing? Yeah, it is. So um, if you have an original image and you use an EXIF viewer, and there's a several free ones online, um, what you can see in a, in a, embedded inside of an original image can help you so much with verification. You can see the location. You can be pinpointed down right to the spot. You can see the time, the date, every little thing about this photo. You can really find out a lot from the EXIF data. Um, I was using a tool called Jeffrey's EXIF Viewer. It's a great name. Um, it's a free one online if you want to Google it. It's uh, very helpful. But this is going to be a really big step in getting, uh, making sure that you have the right image and that you have the original person if it has this data embedded in it. Things that are shared on social networks, they're not going to have this data in it. So if you've got the original that someone sent to you, however method you might do that, whether it's Dropbox, whether it's email, whether it's some more secure methods, this is how you're, one way that's gonna be really helpful for knowing all the information that you can really know about that image, at least from what's embedded in it. Thanks for sticking with us so far. We've been racing through. Um, we're going to take a slight, make a slight pivot here mm -hmm. to talk about the other ways that news gathering can be effective. Mm -hmm. um, and that is focusing on the, uh, some of the ethical sides, now, uh, ethical issues. Now, it's, the ethical issues are directly uh, directly relate to the use of tools, to the way that you are sourcing content. Um, so, um, we, uh, well, Mandy is the uh, vice president of the Online News Association's uh, board in the US. Um, I am uh, on their ethics committee, um, and we've been involved in creating uh, the first industry ethics code for social news gathering, which relates to all of the things that we've been speaking about now, but gives some guidance as to best practice uh, and the, uh, an ethical approach that can help you be competitive. This is all online. We'll show a link at the beginning, but we want to talk about the things like verification as it relates to the ethics in order to make you think about how, you, how, how this will work. This is the code in full, but we're gonna go through, through the individual parts and I'll, I'll let you start, Mandy. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So um, as Fergus said, you know, this is something that's very much key to your workflows, your processes, and it's about making sure that you're building a workflow and a process that's ethical, it's sustainable, and it's something that's going to be able to work for you in a competitive sense. So um, the things that the, the news organizations that have been involved that have signed on to this, you know, we're going to talk through some of these and some examples as to how we got here, too. Uh, all of this language was decided on by a, a group of lots of different news organizations, a couple of NGOs, anyone who has a real interest in the social news gathering space. All of us at First Draft are very closely tied to this. Over a period of about three years yeah, it took to get to process. this point. <laughs> yeah, years ago. So um, topmost, you know, endeavoring to verify the authenticity of user-generated content before publishing or distributing it, holding it to standards that are equal or equivalent to those maintained for content acquired through other means. So, social media, no different from anything else that you're putting into your publications. Pretty simple. So we've got some examples um, of, you know, why verification is so important. Verifi if you're getting verification wrong, it is affecting your credibility. It is affecting, people can see the process that you are taking as you are reaching out to sources, as you find people, you know, that you found through TweetDeck, through your searches on YouTube, you want to be sure that you are reaching out to people that you at least think might be original, an original source. Because in quite a lot of the cases, your audience will, may well be better at doing this than you. And they will call you out. Or you, you, they're, they're going to get a certain impression of you if you are always barking up the wrong tree. So we've got a few examples here of things that have, have appeared on social that, that should never have, never have made it really to to publications. So the Eiffel Tower has been lit up or t lights turned off multiple times, um, linked to multiple uh, news events, tragedies. Most of these uh, occasions have been false. So um, apparently the, the Eiffel Tower was lit up 
for to to commemorate or to to mark the uh, the bombing in or the, the sorry the massacre in in Pakistan. It was not. This was from the World Cup. Right. Um, the Eiffel Tower went dark during the Paris attacks. Um, actually, it didn't. And Mashable have done done something which is actually really. Um, useful here, they have updated it. So this is part of the transparency that we were talking about earlier. Being transparent about the verification process, this content is out there, your audiences are seeing it, but being able to update a story as it becomes clear that it isn't genuine um, is just as important part of the process. Um, and then as, as Mandy mentioned earlier, there were a lot of images coming out of Brussels that were actually from um, other places, and this is a screenshot from some of the, the bunk, debunking that was done uh, through first draft, by first draft. So that's very much um, linking, segueing into being transparent with the audience about verification status of UGC. We are now, you know, quite quite far into. We, we're not amateurs when it comes to working with this content. Now we've been working with it for quite a long time we should be able to verify something to some extent. And it shouldn't just, you know, not verifying it shouldn't necessarily be a, a reason to put it out there just to, to beat the competition. Because in an ethical way, you know, it might be better to be right rather than have to retract it. So um, this is some, so there are different ways that you can be transparent about the status of verification. It might be sharing it with your audience uh, in, the, in the text of a story, in the caption of a photo, in a tweet. And these are some examples of how Storyful. Right, and so uh, a lot of the language, and you, you are seeing it kind of becoming more common. You know, checking, I'm checking on this. This is unconfirmed, this is confirmed, this is verified. Using that kind of terminology and figuring out, you know, what's gonna be working for you. There's not necessarily a standard, but being transparent and using that kind of language so people know the status of something that you're sharing out. If you're share, if you're retweeting, or in this case, you know, well, this was an alert that we sent out. You know, we have unconfirmed that this is what's happened. This is a link to what someone else is reporting, but this is not confirmed in big letters. So everyone knows that this hasn't been verified yet, but we wanna make sure that you know what's out there. This was something shared with news organizations specifically and not readers. So we have to make sure that we're always telling them, this is what we know, this is what we don't know. And that's really important when you're talking to your readers about it too. If, there's, if they're saying, I don't know if this happened, we don't know if the bombers were captured continuing to be very transparent about what, what's confirmed and what isn't. And then inside of every piece that we publish, we're getting into actually all of those points of verification I was telling you about. This is just one piece from Brussels where we posted about how we know who the person was their connection there and how we know the location with the map. Um, that's something that you could work into stories. That's something that could be at the bottom. That could be, you know, however you want to be transparent, it's really helpful for people to know how you know what you know about this, especially if it's something that was sourced on social. I mean, that's something that kind of comes naturally in, in kind of normal reported stories, but in this case, you want, it, you want people to know where this came from. This one specifically was tweeted by Gert D, which is my company, and we only do confirm the stories on Twitter. I mean, every, everyone has their own verification process, Good to know. though. So yeah. um, if you, whoever you are, you know, you have, your, you have your process for doing it, and if you are picking up news from elsewhere, you still need to put it through your your thing because you, you're ultimately giving it to your audience. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think it's, it's also about not spreading misinformation mm -hmm. because that can be, can be quite damaging and as yeah, well. And it gets to that point of independent verification. You know, if it's something where, yes, I, someone I, I trust said this, I'm still going to say, well, until I have, you know, three sources reporting this or I've corroborated or I've done other verification, maybe I'm not going <coughs> to run with it yet. I'll share it. I'll make sure people know about it. But it's about that uh, your, your comfort level that's built into your, your own newsroom about when something is confirmed by your standards, too. So just, just one second. Hmm? Uh, sorry, I, I wanted quickly to react to your previous uh, slide uh, about unconfirmed uh, news. It's not confusing for the reader to uh, read some, some things that is unconfirmed, like you are confusing me. Mm -hmm. um, if you uh, are not sure about the information, mm -hmm. what's the point to publish it? 
Right, and Thank the thing you. is, it, it really does depend on the situation as to how that would work. I certainly don't uh, advocate for sharing unconfirmed information all the time. If something has already been reported, for instance, everybody is sharing it. Like, I'm thinking even, uh, I'm, I used to work for a local newspaper, and if the local TV stations would be reporting something happening, you know, we would retweet it with a note of, we haven't independently confirmed this, but we want you to know that we know that this is out there, and we're looking into it for you, and we're going to let you know about that. So that's really something that's going to be dependent on your own processes and your own workflow, but there are sometimes reasons why you would have something out there that's unconfirmed, as long as you're being honest about what you know and don't know about it. So one, uh, something that's really important about social media that, I mean, that is obvious, but... Um, that people tend to forget is the very public nature of it. It's public and that means we can find people on, on there and we can find sources of stories, but also, also our actions are public. And considering the emotional state and safety of contributors is something that is, is very important for their well-being, but also for your reputation as journalists. A lot, I can't believe how much time, money, um, resource, resources, people, conference time has been spent on talking about the correct social publishing strategy. Yet, journalists are communicating uh, with sources on t things like Twitter in a way that can undo all of that in, in one tweet. So I've got some examples here from um, an incident that happened in, in Oregon last year. Someone, and I've, I, I've blurred out the, the names of the organizations, I hope. Um, OMG, there's someone shooting on campus, okay? And the, a response from someone, a, a, a message from a journalist, hi, are you safe? Can you DM when you find shelter? I'm a reporter for... And then someone immediately jumps in and says, asking students to DM you right now is pathetic. <laughs> we know we have to get the story, but we also know that we don't want the story when someone's not safe. We also know that when someone is safe, they're much more likely to be able to engage with us. And we're much more likely to be able to get access to that story and any images we have. And if we're sensitive about the time that we ask them, we will have more success. She, uh, uh, she continues, students are running everywhere, holy God. She's scared. And if you think it's strange that she is sharing this on social media, that is not necessarily strange. This is an outlet, a legitimate outlet that people feel that, that they can share these things. Mm -hmm. They're sharing it with their friends. They're sharing it with their family. They're not sharing it with us. We are, we are coming into this space. Um, please stay safe and keep out of danger. Only when you are safe and if willing to speak, please let us know. And I probably can't read out the one for the live stream, uh, the response un underneath. Mm -hmm. People are looking at the way that we are interacting with, with uh, regular eyewitnesses who happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if we, if we look insensitive, it's going to reflect on us. Forget that publishing strategy that you've, you've, you've spent months training your staff on. Your, if your reporters are tweeting like this, it's undoing that in one tweet. This, the, when when the, the woman was safe, this is what she tweeted. And if you're a reporter looking for a story, read these next words carefully. I am not interested. So she didn't give her story to anyone, and hundreds of journalists were asking for it while she was in danger. And, and so the argument, well, we have to get the story, we have to chase this, it wasn't effective in any way. She gave the story to no one. So there has to be a better way of doing it. And that's, so we can talk about tools, but, uh, uh, you know, the best way to find these people, but if you're not backing it up with the best way to communicate with them, it's pointless, and any money you might spend on tools is wasted. Um, so this leads into considering the risk inherent in asking a contributor to produce and deliver UGC, including whether it incentivizes others to take unnecessary risks. And we've got, I've got quite, a, it's, a, it's a bit old, but it's a good example. Do you have any pictures of what's going on at the school to share with? This was a, during a, a school lockdown. No, because I didn't think to take pictures while I thought my life was in jeopardy. And, it's a, and she's genuinely thinking that it, her life is in jeopardy. Um, we have to think, this, this is where we have to think about technology a bit more as well. Mm -hmm. So if you communicate with someone, yes, they might read their message when they're safe, okay? But if it's an active situation, 
and your message to them causes their phone to make a sound and they are hiding, what responsibility do you have to that person to keep them safe? Are you, are you potentially exposing them to harm? Um, and there's a few other questions related to that. So assignments versus discovery. Is it right to ask someone to do something once you've contacted them? Do you want them to take any more photos or any more video? What, what, how does your insurance cover them if, if they get injured? Um, what role could a monetary incentive play? If you offer someone money for content, is that going to mean that they, can, they make more? They take unnecessary risks? And does it expose them to danger, additional danger that you can't see? We, as journalists sitting in a newsroom, are often much more aware of the bigger picture that's unfolding. Someone is on, who is on the... And that's why our reporters, the reporters call into the desk. If, you're, if you are an eyewitness, you are not necessarily aware of the bigger picture, and you might not be in the best place to make, to make an assessment of, about risk. Now, I'm remembering a very particular case um, at the Kenya Mall massacre several years ago. Um, there were, there were people, I don't remember the news organization, so I'm not protecting them, I just don't remember who they were. But I do remember seeing a tweet to someone who was inside of the mall, and someone asked, do you think you could film some video? It was appalling. I mean, this person is hiding in a mall where there are gunmen, and it's like, why would you ask them to do that? I mean, maybe you would ask your staff to do that, but this person was just a regular person who doesn't work for you, not covered by your insurance. It's just generally bad practice to be doing that. So there's, um, you know, I'll let you yeah, this. This yeah, so um, you want to consider that the, whatever technical measures to ensure anonymity of sources when required. There are going to be situations where you want to be able to protect that source. You don't know what their situation is, and you don't know, you don't know how much of what you reveal could really come back to hurt them later on. So um, an example of this, you know, we, we had a video uh, a couple of months ago of a, a gangland shooting in Dublin at a boxing weigh-in, and this we knew who the source was. We, we, got, we got this video. Um, this shows people who all witnessed a shooting, at least not, and the person who filmed the video witnessed the shooting. So we wanted to keep this source safe because the people involved with the shooting, they could find out who they are too. And so um, in the case of this one, you know, also noting that even aside from protecting the source, protecting the people in the video, which is something else for us to think about. It's not really in the wording here, but in situations like that, these people shouldn't necessarily be identified. They all witnessed a murder, and the murderers are still at large. So why would you want to identify these people to them? So taking those ethical measures about protecting those sources along the way. And that's also, you know, and I know that you have some examples of it, but you know, also looking at the location from where they're filming. If we can figure that out, somebody else can figure that out too. If someone's recording um, police officers, I remember hearing about that in, um, in Brazil, of recording police officers who were beating somebody up, they were easily found because you could see the point of view that was coming from their balcony that was right next to this police station. I mean, it's doing things like that, that's going to be something that you have to consider, even in the heat of the moment, of how much you might be exposing of somebody else. And, yeah, the, this technical measure, it, sound, it doesn't sound like a technical measure because it's so easy to do, but embedding content. You know, these, some people don't understand the impact of what they're doing, of what they're sharing. And if you are driving traffic to them or potentially driving abuse to them uh, through, through a particularly aggressive uh, online community sometimes, you are exposing those people to something that they never expected to be exposed to. Uh, and that leads us into, into another point here. Seeking informed, informed consent for the use of UGC through direct communication with the individual who created it. Um, yeah, I think you've got, you've got some examples. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and the thing is, is you, know, you want to be transparent um, about how you're going to use this and about what it really means. That's why we talk about informed consent on this. That's why we have a point two of how is this going to be used? You know, how is this going to be distributed? And what platforms will this be on? People don't necessarily always know what they're signing up to. And so making sure that it's very transparent as to how something's going to be used if you're taking it. You know, they might think, oh, yeah, I let my local TV station take this. I didn't expect this to be on the international news and then also on the front page of the newspaper and also that my, my image I took now is everywhere and I didn't know that that was going to be distributed. So really being very upfront about uh, how that's going to work. I witnessed Media Hub who are um, 
members of the first draft coalition as well did a, a, a report on the Charlie Hebdo um, attacks and I, and I Jenny's in the room so I hope I'm not getting it wrong but um, <laughs> there was someone who who had one of the images one of the key images from the event who was a florist and a hat maker a hat maker and she you know she had a business and she, as a hat maker, and she, this video, this photo, um, was picked up by a lot of news organisations and was credited to her as we advocate. Um, but now, whenever anyone goes to search for her hat making business, it's ten pages of Google results, um, you know, with with her picture connected to this attack, and and she and her business can't be found now. Now that's. That's not necessarily, you know, she agreed, she was given the terms, that was all of the, you know, she, she but actually, did she know what it meant? Did she know what, what impact it would have? And she may have chosen not to be credited. So it, it, this informed consent is, is so important. It's, it is our responsibility to let people know this as well, to right. some extent. And just to get a, a glimpse of the approach we take, you know, when, when we're asking about consent on anything, we actually have a page that we point people to so that they can literally see every possibility. Like, this is how this could be used, this is how it's distributed. So if they want that detail, they certainly have it. And they have somebody that they can come back to and they can ask questions as well. They can get into that conversation about, the, you know, what they need to be doing. So, you know, what does your request get you? You know, what is this that's really happening? And, and this is where we might think about tools as well and, and process because if you ask for permission on Twitter then, you know, and you get a response, um, they can retract that, that permission at any point. So if, if you're going to only rely on Twitter um, permissions, then you have to be prepared to monitor forevermore their Twitter accounts to see if they ever retract that permission. So maybe it might be a little bit more clunky to get a full written permission, but at least you don't have to um, worry about monitoring that feed for everything that you've ever requested by Twitter forevermore. So that's what does, and what does your request get you if you're just using social media? Ar does it get you archive rights? Are you able to use it beyond today? Are you able to use it on all of your platforms? If your brand is associated with a certain, with a certain program, uh, publication, print publication, then can you use it online? Can you use it on social? I bet you want to, but you're not technically asking for permission to do so. And what if they retract it? So uh, the kind of key point here is it might actually be more effective to be a bit more ethical when you're, when you're seeking permission. And giving the credit to the, uh, the owner of the content, providing that consideration has been given to potential consequences, including their physical, mental, and reputational well-being. That's what we just spoke about. Mm -hmm. But often people say that giving permission can be clunky, mm -hmm. and it doesn't fit in with your style, but you've got a good example. Right. Yeah, I mean, what I crediting the people behind anything that you're sharing is really important. Um, I really love the way that AJ Plus does it. Everybody has a different means of doing it, but you can see in their videos that they share on social, they've got this great little icon about the network and the username. It blends very nicely in what they're doing, but any way that you want to do this, whether this is on screen credit, this is something that you're putting below, below you know, you're saying with the platform, you're saying who it is. Maybe they, you know, Maybe they want to use their real name, maybe they want to use a username, talking about those things as part of the process. But crediting is very important. If this is something that they want credit on, it definitely should be there. So we've got two more points. Thanks for, for sticking with us, it's almost over. Unfortunately, they're, they're some of the most serious points and they affect us. So um, we didn't, this code is not just covering the, the uh, verification or transparency of a verification. And it's also covering the way that newsrooms treat, treat the whole process. So one point here is endeavoring to, endeavoring to inform and equip journalists to confront the dangers of engaging with sources through social media networks and the digital footprint they leave behind. This is where we need to think about technical solutions for our, for our own people um, and protect uh, protecting people who might be dealing with unsavory sources, who might not realize what they're getting into. And if you have a junior person in the newsroom who's inexperienced, who can't recognize someone that might cause 
you know, potentially pose, uh, pose a risk to them, then you have to think about how you, you equip them. Uh, my experience with this was I worked on uh, Syria through UGC. For, I worked on it for about three years. And the people that we were originally communicating with were protesters who became activists, who became uh, fighters, who became, uh, some of them became militants, who became um, IS. And if you're so used to reaching out to new sources and you're doing the same thing, and then all of a sudden you're asking someone from IS for permission to use your, their video. Or it, it sounds funny, but actually you're so caught up in it. It's something that you need to think about. And if you're, if you're in a global newsroom and you're covering a wide range of, of stories, yes, you might be reaching out to someone who a, who's owns a viral video and asking for them permission. But if that same staffer is then asking for militant video, they, they might be thinking that they do it in the same way. And that's, and that's why the higher level uh, management in newsrooms need to start thinking about this. Um, and I think this is the final point. Uh, supporting and assisting journalists who are confronted with graphic or otherwise disturbing content, maintaining an organizational culture that enables journalists to seek help or speak out when they need to protect their mental health. Now I know there have been multiple sessions on this. Um, and there are experts who have just walked into the room <laughs> on this. Um, but, so we're not going to dwell on it, but we're just going to say that you know, there's been some excellent research by Eyewitness Media Hub, coalition members, um, and just some, some statistics. 37% of, uh, of people in a newsroom did not think they would see traumatic UGC. 46% were not prepared for seeing traumatic UGC. And 56% had not considered the, the negative impact it could have on them. And I think that's the key statistic there. This is really serious, and you really need to have a, a newsroom policy on this. It can really affect you. It can, and you, it's one that you can't take one for the team. You can't protect your staff by looking at all of this stuff yourself, because it doesn't work like that. And it's really important for newsrooms to be equipped uh, to, to handle this and to prepare, prepare management and, and staff. These are, there are some resources here. Uh, there's the Eyewitness Media Hub Research, the Dart Center for, for Journalism Trauma, and um, Pointer also do webinars. There are also other resources, and if you come and find a first draft uh, in the room, we can also help point you in the right direction, but I can't emphasize how important that is for newsrooms. This all sounds clunky, but you can be competitive and ethical. Um, it is possible. This is about raising the standards in the industry, uh, and yeah. Um, so this is a code that you can sign up to. Um, we already have um, a quite wide range of, uh, of supporting, of, of founding supporters, um, including The Guardian, the BBC, CNN, First Draft, reportedly. We've, we've got a, a lot of support um, and we would like you to sign up for it as well if you wish to become a supporter. All of the details are on, are on the link there. You can, eat, you can come and find me afterwards. You can come and find Mandy. Um, just please, please do um, think about signing up and, or ask us any questions. Yes? For the Italian reading uh, crowd here, oh, we also... Uh, made an unofficial translation, and you find it at the URL bit.ly social etica. One word. You can find a write up, an excellent write up of this entire session on firstdraftnews.com in probably like 15 minutes. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for, for coming along, and please follow First Draft. <laughs>